The ride of your life is your life. That's what we're studying so that we understand, don't sit and wait for something spectacular to happen. The ride of your life is your life. And so buckle up every single day for the ride. Today's class is a job worthy of pursuing. A job worthy of pursuing, if I'm, if I'm pronouncing that all correctly. What kind of job is worthy of such pursuit? Once our formal education is completed, wh wherever that is, for some it's it's high school, for others it's GEDs, um, and, and certainly in times past, and maybe even today, it's lesser than that because of situations. But for others, they go on and continue in their education, and some uh, in, in fields where they continue in continuing education on an annual or, or, or every two years, basis. But whenever that formal education is completed, we begin to focus on our life work. And hopefully it's something we love. With love at the core of work, the result is more rewarding. When love is, it, is the motivation, then effort is most pleasurable. Okay? So when one is approaching their work as a calling, the job is no longer exhausting. Instead, it becomes fulfilling. And I, as one who has had many different positions uh, until I found what I was supposed to be doing, nothing connected until I found that job. So I hope you understand that. When one's doing something for the right reasons, and you can take that as a job or anything else, when one is doing something for the right reasons, then doing the right thing and doing the thing right just happens daily, moment to moment. Not because we have to, because we want to when we're doing what we love. The result, everyone is happy with all that happens in that case. Win, win, win. So the, the first uh, page is titled, A Life Lived for God, Rewarded with Up. Okay, remember this whole study is on the, the roller coaster ride of life, ups and downs. A life lived for God is first rewarded with up. This is a true story. Once a man loved the Lord, and the Lord blessed him for this love. The fruits of the man's labor showed in every facet of his life. In all measurable ways, he was considered wealthy. His prosperity was first defined by his good family and his dear friends. And those, those friends enumerated are a loving wife, seven sons, three daughters, and three dear friends. I'm going to name none of them tonight, but you can look them up later. His success, large home, vast cropland, and multiples and multiples of livestock, all cared for by multiple servants. He was a man of great substance, great depth, great faith, great belief in God, great dependence upon all. He was highly favored and highly blessed as a husband, as a father, as a business person. He was noted for his spirituality in his community and noted for his standing in his community before God. And not only by his community, but we get a picture of how God felt about him when God defended him and identified this man as upright and blameless. Oh, that that could be said about any one of us, and even more so about all of us, by God himself. Now, Satan didn't agree with the qualities that were being named as admirable. In fact, Satan felt that anyone could stay virtuous if they were protected by God's hedge. So God and Satan began to discuss and negotiate, and a challenge resulted. A line was drawn in the sand, and God agreed to remove his hedge of protection. And that gave Satan permission to afflict this man. He could do anything to this man except take his life. The agreement was never shared with the man. So all of this was unbeknownst to him. So I'm asking you the question tonight. Do unexplained and unexpected happenings sound familiar to you in your own life? 
despite his love for the Lord and despite all God's blessings, in just one short day, everything changed for this man. Everything that was up was down. And in, in at least one case, literally. Everything except one thing. We'll talk about that later. Please make sure your sounds are down because those will start to bleed in. So someone may, may have their sound still on and I don't want to embarrass anyone. I don't mean by my words. I mean by whatever's happening in your house. Please don't think I'm going to scream and yell at anybody. <laughs> okay. Consider the details of this one day when everything changed. Shockingly bad news began arriving to the man via eyewitnesses. The first messenger shared his terrible news. As he was finishing, the second messenger, messenger came running in with all that he had witnessed. As he was finishing, the third messenger gave his report. And finally, as he was finishing, he was interrupted by the fourth messenger with the worst news of all. The first report said this, the man's oxen and donkeys were all stolen by a gang of thieves who then killed all the servants tending to them other than this messenger who escaped to tell the story. As he was finishing, and what I want you to do is visualize this. I want you to picture yourself as the man. And as this story ends and you hear the devastation of a quarter of all that you own destroyed, in comes another man interrupting. There was fire from sky. I'm assuming that means lightning. I, I try to take and, and interpret what I'm reading when I read the word. But it says fire from sky came down and consumed all the sheep, all the crops, along with the servants tending to all. One of those servants escaped, ran to the man to tell him. Now half of all he has is gone. Then he heard from the third, the third messenger that three different bands of thieves came in from different angles, stole all his camels, and then again killed all the servants tending to them. That being the least identified makes me think he probably had the largest band of, of camels, as this took up probably another 25% of his ownership. Reeling reeling from this these first three reports imagine one two three all coming to you no time to recover a life spent mostly in ups and tag team after tag team after tag team these stories are rolling in till this messenger came running to him i'm sure filled with panic and urgency to tell him that while his children were feasting, all 10 of them together, a windstorm, I again am assuming some dust storm or, or a tornado of some sort, came in and destroyed the home, dropped the roof on all 10 of the children, destroying the house and all of his family, or all of his children, because his wife survived. One day, four reports after a life of of joyous and glorious service to God, one day, everything taken. A life lived for God is navigated through the ups and the downs. Just consider this. Just the news of that first report had crushed the man's spirit. Then each new report brought increasingly worse news. By the time the fourth report came in and the devastation had probably reached a level that was nearly too unbearable for the man. Grieving in pain, he shaved his head and tore his clothes. Rent his clothes is the way that's described. For his people, this was the way to show the deepest grief imaginable. His spirit fully broken, lost in despair. Do you have some connection with this story? Maybe not to this degree, four different reports, but do you have some connection where this sounds familiar? 
I immediately go to different points in my life, different experiences I've had, and I'm embarrassed to tell you the depths of grief I've experienced, and none come close to this story. And not that we would compare. That's a foolish thing to do. Please understand that. Not that we would compare. It's a foolish thing to say, but my troubles aren't as bad as that next person. Listen to me. When you're in these situations, your troubles are as bad as they are. And they hurt and they bring you pain. And you have to individually raise yourself up out of that situation. So please don't find yourself comparing. Now, having said that, I confess to you, I've had these low moments, but nothing in comparison to this story. This story, and I've dug through this all week, is just, just so difficult to understand. And when you try to switch places and, and, and put yourself in the place, it becomes that much more real. We've had a rough year this year with question marks, nothing more. With danger that came very close to our family, nothing more. This man lost everything. So while he was swirling in the multitudes of why questions, and we know those questions, those are questions that are often asked, and rarely are they answered. But we ask them. While he was in this swirl, he was surrounded by the few left who ached for him, who, who ached with him. They sat with him in his grief. If you read the word, they sat with him. His loved ones were angry and hurt, confused. Also question, I have to tell you something. For the longest time, till this week probably, I found great fault in his friends and in his wife. Until I tried to understand the entirety of the story. So now I write to you, his loved ones were angry and hurt and confused and also questioning. And I would add, as they would be. Maybe even as they should be. Certainly as I could be. This left his surviving wife and three close friends, listen to this, tempting him. Those closest to him, tempting him. How did they tempt him? They told him to join them in cursing God. Just curse God. Be done with this. Be done with this foolishness. Just curse God. Told him this is the same God who allowed all these terrible, unfair occurrences to take place. My my interpretation is they told him, scream at the sky, shake your fists at the heavens, curse God. Does this sound familiar to you? When you're in your lowest of lows, those closest to you see and feel your pain. An attempt to bring comfort or support by saying quite possibly all the wrong things. These four were the surviving few who loved him most. They didn't see themselves doing harm. In fact, quite the contrary. They believed they were supporting him with loyalty, with great care for this man that they loved, that they saw was so broken. At this point, his suffering had become so great that it said, and and I'm interpreting that his suffering caused this, but his suffering became so great, he began to break out in skin sores. His emotional, physical anguish must have troubled them to see the friend they loved so much down to nothing. This man who had walked in their community, in their homes, amongst them as the the most successful ambassador for God they had ever met. And now this God had completely turned his back on him and he was left in the dust. So they told him, restart, change directions and start by cursing God told him he was an unloving God anyway, who didn't deserve him. When they said those things, my interpretation is this was the man's get thee behind me moment. And I'll explain what I mean. Jesus was time locked, time locked into confronting his destiny. He had walked for three years with his disciples, 
trying to teach them, prepare them, get them ready to fly solo. He was the mother bird in the nest, feeding them. And they'd open their little beaks, the 12 disciples, open their little beaks, and he'd feed them wisdom. And finally, it was time for them to fly. And so he introduced the news of his impending death to his 12 disciples. I'll be gone soon. I have to give myself up. And Peter impulsively, as he always did. Many love Peter for his impulsive, compulsive outbursts. Put my name on that list. I, I love that about Peter. Peter impulsively blurted out, no, never, not you, Lord. And maybe like the man's for confidence, maybe Peter felt well intended with those words. But Jesus understood where those words were sourced from. Maybe this man understood where the three met, his three friends' words were sourced from, from where his wife's words were sourced from. But, P, but Jesus Christ certainly did. And they became a great burden to him. And I believe because Peter said out loud what Jesus was hiding from everyone else, his, his biggest secret, no, never. That's, of course, what, what Jesus wanted. Lord, if it's your will, take this bitter cup from me. Peter was saying that to him. No, never. So what did Jesus say to Peter, identifying the source? Get thee behind me, Satan. Stop tempting me. And so it is that Satan often finds the passionate loyalty of those closest to the, the weakened person are the easiest weapons to use against such targets. When we're at our lowest, at our weakest, who gets us better than those who love us most, who are so impassioned that they think, they think they're doing best and actually tempting us with thoughts that take us down? Does this sound familiar to you? This man lived a life for God, which included tests throughout his life. I'm going to try to identify those in four separate sessions. The first series of tests involved the man's love for and service to God. And then how he expressed that love in such a way, obviously, that God identified him as upright and blameless. He must have been quite the man of God. Passed every test. The next series of set tests came when God gave him great reward. How would this man carry himself with wealth and success? How would he treat those around him? Would he still carry himself as a man of God or would pride steal him away? Oh, he passed that test as well. The third series of tests came when God removed his protection. He who had everything was left with nearly nothing. How would he respond to the depths of despair, to the words of his friends telling him to curse God, to the temptations to just walk away? How would he fare in such a test? And what about the fourth series of tests? The man withstood his friend's promptings to curse God. We know this story. He experienced profane or profound pain. Listen to this. When I reread this this week, I found how deeply he was pained, how close he came to giving up, cursing even the day he was born. When I think of people I've counseled who are at the lowest of low, and I consider what their next step is, it's not. A good step next. And so this man rode that line of, of, of as Shakespeare says, uh, the great question. Will I continue or not? To be or not to be, in case you don't know what I'm quoting from. Shall I continue or shall I not? And, and this man was right on the cusp of making that terrible decision. Everything gone. Body completely giving up, cursing life, and I'm sure claiming that the downs now outweighed the ups in his life. Does that sound familiar to you? 
Sometimes when we're so deep in the hole, we can't even see the light anymore looking up from the depths of our situation. However, the man never, ever cursed his God. He stayed faithful. So then the fourth series of tests came. And this set of tests were the replenishment of everything. He had lost everything. He had, he had started with everything, lost everything, and recovered everything. But even more than that, it says he had twice as much wealth as he did before. So similar to that second series of tests, how would he do? Said he lived multiple years, and he stayed with God for the rest of his life. This man dealt with much more than he ever dreamed possible. And most of, most of this, he never saw coming. And I ask you once more, does this sound familiar? Life is absolutely filled with continuous ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. Some of you may define life as these ups and downs. And maybe that's correct. But I think life is better defined by how we navigate through those ups and downs. And the reason is, is you are the man in the story. Each of us is the man in the story. And the ups and downs in life are common to all of us. What's uncommon is how we react to the ups and downs. Our options will always include curse God. You're in a downtime, just curse God and be done with them. But we can also choose to bless God for the downs and, and bless God in the ups. Not just the ups, but also the downs. As we know, we read it just Sunday again. For this is the will of God. That we would thank him for everything. The man didn't remain strong. I want you to hear this. Those of you who might say, oh, if only I could be that strong. He didn't remain strong. He hadn't been used to such bad times. He was ready to throw the towel in. He was ready to give up, to which I would say as his attorney tonight, of course he did. Of course he was weakened. Of course he was ready to give up. So yes, he complained and he wept and he cursed and he screamed and he grieved and he shouted at the sky. I'm certain of all of that. Maybe even moments of being convinced by his friends, never uttering, yes, I'll curse God, never cursing God in his mind, but coming that close. But the key is he never did. He never gave up on God. He never denied God. He stayed true to his God. And now I ask you one more time, does all of that sound familiar? If you're on this call tonight, it is familiar to all of you. You've hung on through whatever defines your life. It isn't Job's job that's worth pursuing. So when you read the title of tonight's class, it wasn't pronounced job at all. It was pronounced Job, a Job worth pursuing. It isn't Job's job that's worth pursuing. It's Job's calling that's worth pursuing. Job's response to the ups and downs that's worth pursuing. Job, a man of God, is worthy of our pursuit. Oh, that I could be Job in my time of crisis. And I just want to say this one more time. You are each Job. You may never touch on the heights of his ups, but you'll have your ups. You may never reach down to the lows of his downs, but you'll have your downs. You may never hear anyone specifically say to any of you, curse God. But you'll be presented with choices to deny or embrace God, to be angry or to still love him. And you will not curse God. Now. I can confirm this. That sounds familiar to this group of people tonight, the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, homework assignment this week. Find someone who is down. And I was going to write help them, 
but I thought, no, let's just give it to you hard tonight. Bring them up. That's it. I don't know how you get there. I don't know how you do it. Find someone who's down and bring them up. And now here's the extra credit. Make note of your position before you start this. And then make note of your position after you help them find their way up and see if it doesn't change how you stand, your posture, your spiritual, your spiritual awareness. See if by helping someone else, by recovering someone else, that you aren't lifted up as well. Find someone who's down and bring them up. Because 